Pez is its own candy company. It's not part of Hershey or Nestle like you might assume. It's actually privately owned by the Haas family, descendants of the person who invented Pez back in the 1920s. It's a big company too. They say on a yearly basis, they distribute 70 million dispensers and 5 billion candies to over 80 countries around the world. So I'm guessing that we all know what I'm talking about. There's no mistaking Pez because they have a unique thing going on. If you want to eat candy out of a cartoon's neck, there's not a lot of other options. I know, that was a weird sentence, but that's what it is. It's kind of the ultimate product for kids. It's both a toy and a candy. Plus, it's cartoon-like, it's collectible, but there's been a lot of changes since the 1920s. They weren't always intended for kids. Through the years, they've gone through some drastic changes in both product and the marketing of it. There's a lot to talk about here, and the roots of it go even further back than the 1920s. I think it's necessary to get the full picture. In 1800s Austria, Edward Haas I was a family practitioner. I think it would be appropriate to describe him as a mad scientist, but with good intentions. He was actually one of the first people to utilize baking powder when he created a new form of it to be used in baking cakes. Some of his patients were having stomach issues, and he learned that it had something to do with the yeast that they were eating in their desserts, so he invented this baking powder as an effective alternative. Unfortunately, he never had much of a chance to capitalize on the invention, because soon after, he was working on a new medical solution Solution, but this time his experiments involved injecting himself with whatever he created and it killed him at the time of his death Edward Haas II was in medical school soon to be a doctor as well But after the death of his father money was tight and he was forced to drop out and enter the grocery business He eventually opened his own store and operated it for decades. I know everything I've said so far seems unrelated Well, I'm about to bring it all together with Edward Haas the third as a teenager He took advantage of his father's and his grandfather's creations when he started making baking powder using his grandfather's recipe to be sold in his father's store. To be fair, I believe his father may have been selling it at the store in some capacity already, but either way, it was the young Edward Haas III who made it successful. And to cut out confusion, anytime I say Edward Haas from now on, I'm referring to the third one. Alright, it was selling well because he had an effective way of conveying the uses for it. There were ads placed in the newspaper, which was a revolutionary new form of advertising at the time, but also he would include baking tips and recipes with the product. After a while, he took that to the next level when he started selling it already mixed with other cake ingredients to form an early version of a cake mix. Now, Haas was a big fan of these peppermint candy type things, but at the time they were made exclusively in pharmacies in a process that was fairly inefficient and pricey. It was boiled and some of the peppermint oil would be wasted. So by the 1920s, the business was doing well and Haas had a team of scientists working for him that he teamed up with to try to improve this process. The end result was this much more effective cold pressing technique that allowed them to mass produce these square shaped peppermint candies. To name it, he took the word pfeffermins, meaning peppermint in German, got rid of the F's and most of the other letters, and there you have it. These little candies, they seem basic enough, but it took three generations of various breakthroughs and innovations to make them possible. Quite possibly, one of the most well-known facts about Edward Haas is that he was an advocate of good health and was actively against smoking. And this was back in the 1920s when it was far more socially accepted and decades before everyone truly knew how dangerous it was. Actually, combating cigarette smoke was his main intention behind creating Pez. He envisioned it as a smoking alternative. If someone is looking to light up a cigarette, maybe they could reach for a Pez instead and it'll reduce that craving. At the very least, someone can eat it when they're done smoking and then it would at least make things more pleasant afterward and to the people around them. I'd say it's an honorable mission, even one ahead of its time. All of this meant that the initial Pez back in 1927 Austria would be marketed towards smokers, which obviously made the public perceive this product far differently than we do today. One of their famous early slogans was, smoking prohibited, <laughs> Pezzing allowed. And then they had these Pez girls that would appear on the posters and go around handing out samples. In the early years, there were no dispensers. They were typically sold in this small tin, and the flavors were boring. Pepper 
peppermint, of course, was the big one at first, but they soon introduced lemon and chlorophyll. I have to admit, I wasn't familiar with chlorophyll flavor before just now, but it appears to be a minty, plant-like taste. I don't know, but I can confirm that for almost 30 years, everything about Pez was intended for adult smokers. They did not make any attempt to sell it to kids. Even the dispensers that came out over 20 years after the first Pez were intentionally created to resemble a lighter to better appeal to the smoking community. They didn't have any big cartoon heads on them, they were classy, or at least supposed to be anyway. They had a practical use too. You know, Pez is a sharing candy, you want to be able to offer one to your friend. But with this tin that they had, your friend would be trying to grab one and then his fingers would be touching all the other ones around it. No one wants that, so they created the dispenser. It would give you one candy at a time while keeping all the other ones protected. Actually, it's sort of the perfect solution. Now, keep in mind that everything I've talked about so far has been isolated to Austria and other parts of Europe. In the early 1950s, they identified the United States as a potential new market. It was a high population area with a growing economy. So they obtained a US patent for their dispenser and started shipping them over the Atlantic along with the candy to be sold there. In the US, they were a little broader with their marketing because they were trying to attract anyone who was concerned with their health. Most of their claims were a bit of a stretch. They would say that it makes you feel better about yourself because it gives you better breath or that you could lose weight because you won't be as hungry after you eat one. A lot of stuff like that, but I think almost anyone would consider this effort a failure. To use a basketball metaphor, the way I see it, there was a second left on the clock and their only chance at winning the game was to toss up that half court shot at the buzzer. They did it when they started marketing toward children. It was slow at first, but the full transition I'd say happened pretty fast, within a few years. I'm sure you can already tell most of the changes that they made. They introduced more appealing fruity flavors, lowered the price, made things more colorful, and even turned that classy dispenser into a toy. At first, they tried to make the whole body into one big toy, which seems weird today. They did it with a Santa Claus and this robot space guy in 1955, but soon learned that it wasn't worth it. It turned out to be significantly easier and cheaper to keep the body the same and just add that head part. 1957 was the first time that they did it. It was with a witch, and then a year later, they got into licensed characters with Popeye the Sailor. They went on to advertise on TV during cartoons and kid shows and quickly made a licensing deal with Disney to have Mickey Mouse and some of the other classic characters made into Pez form. It was all a big success. It wasn't long before everyone in the US knew the name Pez and the candy and the dispensers and the whole concept. But here's the conflicting part. I just think about poor Edward Haas over in Austria. I'm sure that he wanted to make money with his business by selling Pez, which is what he was doing, but he also had a mission. It was to get people to stop smoking and just to promote general health. But these changes transformed the business into almost the exact opposite direction. They were now selling candy to children, in the US anyway, which did end up becoming a huge part of their business, accounting for half of all their Pez sales by 1970. From what I can tell, he was very much against the new direction in the beginning, but eventually caved in and agreed to it, because, well, they were losing the game and there was no time to draw up a better play. I imagine that this was an ethical dilemma that he struggled with for a while, with no easy answer. His legacy is attached to something that may very well be setting back his life's mission. Here's the nutrition facts for a roll. It's not the worst thing, but it's also not a health food either. I don't know, it's just something to think about, how an invention with very clear intentions can stray so so far away from them. Again, not much happened for the next 20 years. That's how this company seems to work. Something big tends to happen every 20 or 30 years. I will mention that in the 1970s, they started producing Pez candy in the US rather than shipping it over from Europe. Not the dispensers though, only the candy. In the 1980s, they added the little feet to them to make them stand up better, but I still recommend that you use caution. They are still not the sturdiest, and if you get enough of them together, you're on a high risk of having a falling domino situation. Just saying. It was in the 1990s when big things started to happen again. It's crazy because they surged in popularity when adults started buying them. That's right, they went from adults to kids back to adults, all buying them for different reasons. I challenge anyone watching this to name another product where the age of its core customer has shifted around this much. Collecting things in general was big in the 1990s, and this was just a perfect product for it. There was a variety of different ones, some of which were discontinued, which gave them different levels of scarcity to to which you can assign value. Some of these have sold for hundreds, even thousands of dollars. The first Pez Collectors Convention was in 1991, and then in 1992, there was a notable Seinfeld episode called The Pez Dispenser that I suspect played a big part in propelling their popularity. I won't spoil it, but Jerry pulls out this Tweety Bird Pez Dispenser
dispenser that makes Elaine laugh at an inappropriate time, it's good stuff, and brought a lot of attention to the product. It was a very popular show, and it was heavily featured in the episode. Also, I should mention that in the 1990s, Pez did play a small part in establishing eBay. It was, however, a much smaller part than was commonly reported. I have a whole video about that if you're interested. But my whole point is that during the 1990s, Pez was taken to a new height. And as I said in the beginning, they are still huge today, selling billions of candies and millions of dispensers around the globe every year. Let me know in the comments, do you have any personal connection to any of this? I guess what I'm really asking is, are you a Pez collector, or have you at least owned any of them? Also, I want to point out how the marketing and the public's perception has been a big part of this story, going all the way back to including the recipes in that baking powder, then more significantly, their switch from targeting adults to children in the 1950s. Those were major changes that had a huge impact on the company. Without them, they likely wouldn't be here today. So any thoughts on any of it, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.